So uh, whether it's a morning, noon, or evening, I am really happy that you're joining us. My name is Maya Foner. I work on the Israeli JFN team on programs and content. And uh, joining me today and helping me with the hosting is my colleague, Reut Stoller. Um, thank you all for coming to today's program, the Nita Loli Peace Act, which I will call MEPA from now on, just to uh, make it a bit shorter. What should funders know? Um, we're very happy and honored to have with us today Georgette Bennett and Dani Hakim, as well as the speaker, John Linden, which I will introduce shortly. Um, we're hoping through today's program to help provide an overview of MEPA and provide practical information to those of you who are involved in this field or are seeking to become involved. We're going to go through practical things like timeline, eligibility, and other criteria, but also background, um, uh, and we'll, we'll just learn a lot about it. We're also hoping to jumpstart the process of funders preparing for the MEPA funding, starting to think of how you would like to prepare your own grantees for maximizing this fantastic opportunities. Opportunity. Uh, we will start with a presentation from John Linden, who I'll introduce in a minute, followed by um, interviews with Georgette and Dani, who I'll also introduce a bit later. And in the end, we will have a fair amount of time for Q&A. But if you happen to have questions during the presentations, you can pop it in the chat box and uh, we will come back to it later during the Q&A. Um, John is the executive director of the Alliance for Middle East Peace, known as OLMEP, the largest network of peace building organizations in the region, uh, who were also the lead advocate in the passage of the Nita M. Lowley Middle East Partnership for Peace Act, as I said, the MEPA. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm happy to turn it over to John. Wonderful, thank you so much, Maya, and thank you everybody for joining um, at what we think is a very exciting moment for, for the peace building field, both uh, working in shared society and in cross-border peace building. I'm just gonna share my screen. I'm gonna try and do a, a quick PowerPoint. Um, can everybody see that okay? All right. Yes. Um, so as Maya mentioned, um, all met the Alliance for Middle East Peace, we're the largest network of peace building NGOs working amongst Israelis and Palestinians. And we do two things. One of them is particularly important for this conversation. The first is working directly with our members, over 150 groups, to try and uh, increase capacity to incentivize cooperation and introduce best practices. The second thing we do is to advocate to governments right around the world for far greater resources for peace building. And just before getting into the, the what of MEPA, it's probably worthwhile talking a little bit about the why. Uh, we know that um, this sort of work, peace building as practiced by many of our members, is incredibly effective. Uh, transforming the attitudes, the lived experiences, and then the behavior of Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, it's been observed in other conflict and post-conflict societies to be very effective too. In fact, studies done by Notre Dame University and George Washington University in the last few years have shown that between two thirds and three quarters of participants have heightened uh, belief in the possibility of peace in understanding the narrative of the other and a willingness to take action in service of those goals. And we know that it's particularly effective when applied to particularly young stakeholders. So if on the one hand, we know this work is very effective, and on the other hand, we see, relatively speaking, how little funding has gone toward it relative to other priorities, we at OMEP felt it was in a, a very, very important uh, mission to try and change that, particularly when one looks at the youth attitudes amongst Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, I think things are getting worse rather than better. The younger the cohort you look at, Sadly, the, the greater the uh, uh, likelihood for attitudes around dehumanization and denial of the, the legitimacy of, of, of the other. So we have a tool that we know works and a funding gap between the current situation and it being able to have a transformative impact on, uh, on the conflict at large. Now for this presentation, I'm gonna try and be as quick as I can because I think the questions and answers part is where we'll get the most utility, but I'll give a background very briefly on the funding up until this moment for Israeli-Palestinian peace building. Then obviously MEPA or the Lowy Fund itself. And I'll give as, as thorough a summary as I can, but please, if you do have questions, do ask them either in the chat or in the Q&A at the end. And then we'll talk a little bit about opportunities for, for Jewish Funders Network members and for private philanthropy in general, because we really feel this is a big bang moment uh, and there is an opportunity 
for smart actors in the private uh, philanthropic sector to be able to retool their strategies and really take advantage of what is the single biggest investment in this work in history. Um, so just moving quickly onto the sort of the snapshot of the status quo as existed before the passage of the Lowy Fund. Um, so the two main funding streams that the US government ran prior to the passage of MEPA in December of last year were something called MEPI or the US Middle East Partnerships Initiative, which has an average grant size of $15,000. Uh, and is uh, active across the wider Middle East as well as in the Israeli-Palestinian sector, and then CMM, or Conflict Management and Mitigation. Now, our advocacy helped to create CMM almost 15 years ago at this point, and at its highest point, it was putting in between 12 and $13 million every year into both shared society work, and all, which is between Arab and Jewish citizens of Israel, and cross-border work between Israelis and Palestinians. However, you know, whilst we're very proud of our role in getting CMM over the line and keeping it obligated every year, when you look at the population of Israelis and Palestinians and the attitudes that I spoke about a little bit earlier, where we had 73% of Palestinians during the Knife Intifada a few years ago who supported uh, using those violent attacks as a, as a means of political expression, almost half of Israeli Jewish high school students who didn't believe that Arab citizens of Israel should be allowed to vote or sit in the Knesset. This funding, as great as it is, simply isn't commensurate with the scale of the problem and the potential of the programming to play a, a really critical role in conflict resolution. So this is why we have been advocating for something far greater. And if you look at the CMM obligated and spending budgets over the last sort of uh, decade or so, you can see that we've had a, a net decline, frankly, particularly in cross-border work. Now, obviously in October, 2018, uh, President Trump cut completely cross-border funding via CMM, continued the shared society work. We advocated very strongly for that to be the case. But even before President Trump, you can see in real terms a decline. So the field has contracted at a moment when diplomacy has also been failing. And there has been, frankly speaking, less hope and optimism in general. Well, we feel that now is a moment with the passage of MEPA to really see radical reinvestment in the capacity for the field and that it can actually be a tool to reinvigorate uh, diplomacy and, uh, and, and policy aiming towards resolution of the conflict. And that isn't just an intuition on our part. We do look at, um, at what's worked in other successfully resolved conflicts. Sadly, we don't have all that many precedents for successfully resolved conflicts in the last 100 years or so. Uh, but one, if it's difficult to follow my accent, by the way, it's because I'm, I'm Irish. So I am the net beneficiary of a very successful peace process that the United States led on at roughly the same time as the Oslo process, but took a very, very different approach. Whereas Oslo appeared suddenly as if out of outer space in September, 1993, confounding everybody. The Good Friday Agreement, which was concluded in 1998, was actually the result of around a decade and a half of sustained investment and work to get to a, uh, a peace agreement. And if we look at the two different paradigms side by side, I think there's an awful lot that we can learn from borrowing from the Northern Irish example. And at the center of that story in Northern Ireland was something called the International Fund for Ireland, which directly invested or leveraged well over $2 billion into peace building work in the island of Ireland. And it started 12 years before the agreement to build the civil society muscle, the relationships, the trust that could then help to make any political process fruitful. And um, Tony Blair's chief negotiator, Jonathan Powell, called it the great unsung hero of the peace process. Uh, and it really wasn't only ambitious in its scale, because if you're looking at, it was $2.4 billion once it's netted out, um, the population of Northern Ireland at around that time was around 800,000 people. So this is a huge spend. It's $44 per person per year for 20 years, starting 12 years before the peace deal, and then continuing eight years afterwards when it's secured. By comparison, amongst Israelis and Palestinians, we spend less than $2 per person per year and only really started spending it after Yitzhak Rabin had been assassinated. So we looked at this model and, you know, a decade and a half ago really started advocacy in the United States and around the world for such a concept. That is what directly resulted in the passage last year of MEPA. But just before we move on to MEPA, it's also resulted in momentum elsewhere in the world. So the United Kingdom has officially endorsed the International Fund concept. And actually just in the last few weeks, uh, the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrat Party have joined the Conservative Party in officially endorsing it. And it's, it's very, it's important to note, it's quite rare for all of those parties to agree on one policy for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is a very divisive foreign policy issue. And it mirrors the bipartisan support 
that we managed to generate in, um, in Congress that allowed the Lowy Fund to pass last year. And not just the support of, um, of members of Congress or of different political parties, we also, in the passage of MEPA or the Lowy Fund, saw an unprecedented, unprecedented coalition of supporting organizations from APAC and AJC to J Street, the New Israel Fund, Americans for Peace Now, Israel Policy Forum, really a full um, plethora of the organizations who are you know, engaged on this issue in Washington, DC. And I think as we see so much polarization around this conflict and generally in politics these days, it's important to note that this sort of support for peace building can actually bring together people who usually uh, don't agree. In the UK, it brought together the Friends of Israel groups as well as the Friends of Palestine groups. Groups, and that's that's quite unusual. So as I mentioned, in December of last year, we saw the Lowy Act uh, passed into law. You can see there an event that we held in Congress honoring Nita Lowy, who was the chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee, for whom the, the, the law is now named, and who really was a leading force in ensuring the legislation got over the line, but was also joined not just by, by Mrs. Lowy, but by people like Chris Coons, Tim Kaine, and Lindsey Graham in the Senate, and Jeff Fortenbury, a Republican colleague of Nita Lowy, a Democrat in the House, and really, again, demonstrating, I think at a time when Israeli-Palestinian issues were particularly divisive, uh, that we could find something that bipartisan um, coalitions of lawmakers could unite around. So the, the act itself is the largest ever investment in Israeli-Palestinian peace building. It is $250 million over the next five years. So $50 million for each of those fiscal years. And it's divided into two buckets. I'm happy to talk about both of them in the questions and answers. I'm going to focus a little bit more centrally on the first part, which is called the People to People Partnership for Peace Fund. Don't worry so much about the, the long names or the acronyms. This is the part of the fund which will be invested in civil society peace building programs and people to people projects. So you can see the definition that it's operating under. It's projects that will support peaceful coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians. Now, in the last few weeks, we've had the first call for proposals published. So we now have um, much more thorough guidance in a 70 or 80 page document issued by USAID, which is going to be responsible for administering the fund, which shows you know, in, in greater clarity what sort of priorities will be funded. They look for horizontal linkages between the peace building field and things that can plus up into policy change, which we think is quite exciting mm -hmm. because the scale of resources on offer really are commensurate with that kind of ambition to really create the capacity that is necessary for conflict resolution to take place. Um, after the presentation, I can put some links into the chat bar for resources that people can check for further information, as well as my email address. I'd be happy to answer any questions and follow up. So the fund itself will establish a 15 member advisory board, which will be comprised of 13 individuals who have technical or regional experience, and then two additional board seats for international governments, most likely, as I mentioned, we're getting growing support from many, many countries around the world to join this initiative. And it will prioritize cross-border work, but will also fund shared society programming. So that means that at least 50.1% of the funding is likely to go to work that brings together Israelis and Palestinians, with the remainder work, working um, for shared society priorities, particularly important after the violence that we saw in mixed cities in May. And I think we've been discussing with USAID ways in which that funding can scale some of the pretty significant capacity that's been built in that space over the last decade or so. Uh, importantly, it also, in our interpretation of the language, will likely fund unilateral work in the West Bank and Gaza that is consistent with the sort of aims and ambitions of MEPA. So it may be as a springboard towards cross-border work, but at the start is perhaps only funding encounters between Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. The second part of the fund is the Joint Investment for Peace Initiative, the JIP, and that's going to be funding economic projects via the issuing of loans and grants that are aimed at strengthening the Palestinian private sector. The International Fund for Ireland, which I mentioned earlier, that was a hybrid fund that harnessed economic and civic tools in tandem. And what's quite exciting about doing this together via one uh, institutional framework is that you can I hate this word, but sort of synergize the, the investments, right? So you can use economic and civic tools at the same time, hand in glove. And we know that both the economic and civic dimensions are essential for conflict resolution. Uh, and the, the JIP part of the fund, as well as strengthening the Palestinian private sector, giving opportunities for young Palestinian entrepreneurs, for small and medium sized businesses, can connect the Palestinian private sector with the regional and international economy way in a way that really isn't the case today. 
Um, so it's important to note also in this first appropriation year for, for MEPA, $46 million has been appropriated for USAID, which is going to be predominantly responsible for the civic part, but potentially for some economic capacity building. And the, the joint investment for peace will be administered by something called the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation, which is uh, a separate arm of the federal government, but there will be close coordination between both entities. And we expect the DFC to be more operational next year with USAID doing probably the lion's share of the investments in the short term. Um, so just to zoom in a little bit on what this fund will do, the people to people uh, component of it that I mentioned. So they're looking for concept papers now the, the request for proposals has been published. Again, I'll share a link that will provide more thorough information, but there's gonna be a rolling 12 month uh, window for applications running until September of 2022 with a minimum of $15 million, but we expect quite likely more money to be added to that within that fiscal year. And already at $15 million, that's the most that's ever been invested in peace building in any 12 month cycle. But we're excited about again, the potential for additional investment. And the, um, the, the top grant size, the ceiling is $5 million, which again is very significant relative to, to historic uh, grant ceiling. So it really is an opportunity for ambition to be tested and for you know, quite capital intensive ideas uh, that previously didn't have, didn't have a home, certainly in government funding, to now be able to have this sort of stable and very ambitious level of funding over the long term and you know, there's a five-year um, appropriation for this, but we're going to be working very hard to try and ensure that that the Lowy Fund remains a fixture, and that we have this foreseeable, dependable investment with other countries coming and adding to it. And so that what we're seeing right now, as historic as it might be, is the floor rather than the ceiling of this uh, legislation and what it can achieve. And it's going to be supporting peace building and stabilization for those civic and economic ties and investments that I mentioned. Um, mitigating unemployment, increasing the middle class, but also advancing shared community building between and amongst Israelis and Palestinians, and, uh, and hopefully encouraging actors that currently are not in building to move into it. And this is an important point. It's actually a good segue towards some of the opportunities for, um, uh, for JNF members, or JFN members rather. Um, we don't just feel, all MEP have over 150 members. We hope and believe that some of this funding will go towards it. Uh, we think there's a lot of uh, capacity there that's waiting to be, uh, uh, to be catalyzed. But we also think there's an opportunity now for other actors to move into this space. Frankly speaking, the resources have been so low in relative terms in recent years that very many smart, ambitious, dedicated people looked at that, looked at the really toxic political environment and said, you know what, I'm better off going to high tech or into academia or something else. And we hope that this can be seen as a big bang moment that this funding now should attract people and ideas that are really ambitious and disruptive. And there's a, a catalytic role that private philanthropy can play as well, because um, you, you will know as private uh, philanthropists that we don't tend to have a dependable context in this, uh, in this conflict, that the funding cycles and the economic variables move around quite a lot as well as the political dynamics, of course. Right now we have a stable, foreseeable, historic investment for the next five years, which provides a great context for private philanthropy. I'm obviously biased, but I think every private philanthropist should be, whether it's only incremental or radically, reshaping their strategy now, uh, if they're invested in either shared society inside Israel or in cross-border peace building, because this is frankly such a big variable that is going to, over the next five years, change an awful lot of the variables that previous strategies were built upon. And there's important things that only private philanthropy can do right now. I mean, number one, I would say really trying to make sure that your grantees or the organizations you care about are fully aware of this opportunity. Please do put them in touch with us if they need any additional information. We're really, and this is why we're very grateful uh, to JFN, we're trying to get the word out as broadly and widely as possible about this legislation and what it means. So your help in doing that would be very much appreciated, but also for your grantees and organizations you care about to develop a growth plan that accommodates this funding, because it's great that all this resource, these resources are coming. We wanna make sure that absorption capacity is there, that the organizational structure and capacity can take the investment that's coming. Not every organization, if you pour millions of dollars on it, Will, will succeed, some of them will collapse. And it's really important to make sure that the basics and the fundamentals are in a really strong place. 
The other part is general programmatic and project capacity building. So there's an opportunity right now to scale ideas and organizations that you think are game changers. And whilst there's no guarantees, it's highly likely that the most scaled, efficient, and ambitious organizations will be amongst the grantees. And it's important to note, this is a marathon rather than a sprint, at least five years, with every year, many organizations getting multi-million dollar investments and being taken out of the competitive pool for the next year. So in blunt terms, the probability of an organization getting funding increases over time as resources increase and competition for those resources likely decreases or at least stays flat. And you know, if you invest in an organization or a coalition of organizations that all of a sudden are ripe for investment, hopefully they will get that investment and giving you as a private philanthropist, particularly in the peace building space, a sort of unprecedented return on investment. I think those of us invested in this space haven't, haven't seen a great ROI over the last decade or so. And I'm hoping that that's now gonna change thanks to some of the funding that's coming online. Uh, the last thing I would really encourage people to do is to try and encourage via your philanthropy partnerships across the space. So we, everything that Allmap does is based upon this culture of cooperation and partnership, but the field being more than the sum of its parts. And if we incentivize via funding and some of the programs that are being rolled out, partnership and collaboration horizontally amongst a coalition of organizations will help to not only deliver better programs and outcomes, but also a greater culture of partnership. So for organizations who want to compete for a $5 million grant, frankly, there isn't all that many individual organizations at that scale right now. Hopefully that will change. But if they come together with you know, two or more other organizations, suddenly you have a more scalable program but also baked in partnership that will last over the life of the grant. And the final point is to think about pivoting to cross-border work. If, if you don't already as a philanthropist, this is now the, um, the best time to do so because of the funding undergirded coming via the Lowy Fund, but also grantees. Because the majority of the funding will be going to cross-border peace building, there's an opportunity for shared society entities who maybe have a very innovative programming to, to think about moving into the cross-border space, even if it's just for a pilot project. And some of the capacity built in mixed cities over recent years could help to strengthen some of the cross-border peace building, which has been so chronically underfunded and has obviously had a very difficult political environment over recent years. Um, so I'm gonna pause there and hand over to Georgette and Danny for their presentations. I'm happy to answer any questions a little bit later. Uh, thank you, John. Um, so our next part, I would like to introduce two JFN members. Uh, who I was um, honored to work with over the last two months. Um, Georgette Bennett, who's the immediate past chair of JFN, founder of the Tenenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding and Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees. And her book on Syrian-Israeli Humanitarian Partnership has just been released. And we are putting the link right now in the chat. Um, and I would like to introduce Dani Hakim, who is a philanthropist, athlete, and educator. He has been active in the field of education, peace building, and sports for social change for over 20 years, and serves on the boards of OMEP, the Israeli Foundation, Maccabi World Union, and Sports for Social Change. Um, so first off, I would like to uh, um, interview Georgette. And Georgette is uh, actually representing the uh, cross-border um, uh, uh, part of the, of the peace building um, field. So Georgette, tell me a little bit about the work that you are involved in and what is the opportunity that you see here as a funder? Thank you, Maya. Um, and thank you for organizing this and to John for that terrific briefing. So, this, this particular opportunity really taps into three aspects of my identity. During my tenure as uh, chair of JFN, one of my biggest priorities was to cultivate working relationships with Arabs. As a sociologist, I learned early on that contact and communication and joint work are the best ways to overcome misconceptions. And as a philanthropist, my primary interests are bridge building, conflict resolution, confronting hate, and intergroup relations. Now, all of those priorities dovetail 
in the Nita Lowy Act. So as, as you said, uh, Maya, in relation to that act, my focus is primarily on cross-border work, which isn't only just Palestinian Israeli, but also regional, but also some shared society work. So in terms of cross-border work, there are a number of relevant organizations in my funding portfolio. Um, one of them is um, the Tannenbaum Center, which you mentioned earlier, with, with this Peacemakers in Action program that's been very much involved with um, track one, uh, sorry, track two diplomacy, meaning people to people to work, work. And we have a number of peacemakers that uh, are involved in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Another one is Zimam Palestine, which is a Palestinian organization that's right now involved in single group work. They're an anti-extremism organization. And um, their, their story is, is right in their motto, which is live for Palestine, don't die for Palestine. And their focus is on institution building and leadership development, which is laying the groundwork for cross-border work. Then there's the Center for Peace Communications, which launched the Arab Council for Regional Integration. And that, that organization is completely focused on normalization of relations with Israel. And the Arab Council is, is headed by Mohammed Dajani, who comes from one of the most historically important and distinguished Palestinian families. Then there's the Truman Institute for the Advancement of Peace, which is a think tank that's at the Hebrew University. And they have a clinic for peace and conflict resolution. And their Middle East unit is the largest research unit that they have. And then there's Accord, which has developed socio-psychological tools to rehabilitate Arab Jewish relationships. So those are the ones that fit under the cross border category. In terms of shared society, um, the Tannenbaum Center has a coexistence curriculum and teacher training. Uh, the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes new ways of living together in a deeply divided society and region. And again, Accord, which is using its socio-psychological model for shared Jewish Arab spaces like workplaces and academic campuses. And, and I, since Sarah Silver is, is on the Zoom, I do want to uh, do a shout out to the Abraham Fund, which I'm also proud to support because they've been doing exactly this kind of work for, for decades. And, because I'm also a criminologist, I've been particularly interested in the police training that they've done. So those are some of the organizations within my funding portfolio that um, I think can uh, make enormous contributions using these resources that are now being made available. Now, the opportunities that I see, I guess, First and foremost, the opportunity that I see, uh, borrowing from Micah Goodman, is the opportunity to shrink the conflict. If the conflict can't immediately be resolved, then there's still a lot that can be done to shrink it in the meantime. Now, Micah has recently become an advisor to Naftali Bennett, and we see his footprint all over the uh, big changes in policy that have taken place recently in terms of um, how the government deals with Palestinians. And with all of these additional resources coming in, um, I think that we'll be able to really scale up those efforts. Now, for a long time, Israel has had something like 600 coexistence organizations, and they have been starved for funds because at one point, uh, government funding in Israel completely dried up for those organizations. So this is going to allow them to scale up again and become more effective. 
it's also going to be an opportunity to advance the Abraham Accords agenda. Now, Palestinians, many of them feel betrayed and abandoned because of the Accords. Um, but in fact, those accords are going to give regional actors more leverage in bringing about a two-state solution. Uh, and the Arab Council is, is a perfect example of that. But resources are needed to protect those Arab civil society leaders and officials who take the risk of advocating normalization. Just a week ago, there was a meeting in Iraq where um, Iraqi civil society leaders um, engaged in a conference advocating for normalization of, of relations with Israel. Now in Iraq, it is a crime punishable by death to have any contact with Israelis. So many of those participants' lives are now under threat and they've had to um, hide out in the Kurdish region, which is refusing to turn them over to the Iraqi government. So this is a dimension that we need to pay attention to. Enough resources to provide security for those who are willing to engage in cross-border work um, throughout the region, but also between Israelis and Palestinians because as we know, many Palestinians who do try to advocate for normalization are also under threat within their own communities. Also- uh, Georgette, I, I just want you to be aware of the time and I know that, that we had a few more questions uh, to get through. So can, is it okay if I go to the next question? Because people want to hear about your your uh, how you're preparing your grant. Sure. Are you ready for that? Okay. I am. You. Um, so you're so involved in this field and what I wanted to ask is what, what have you been doing to prepare your grantees to build future resilience and what capacity building measures have they taken? So I've been, first of all, reaching out to all of my grantees to make them aware of this resource. And it turns out most of them were already aware of it and most of them were already preparing. I've been working with my grantees on positioning and identifying which of their programs are the best candidates for these grants, because I think positioning is very important because as I read the Nita Lowy bill, um, there, there are some nuances that, that are missing. And one of those is that we have to make the case for the importance of single group work in preparing for cross-border work and shared society. One of the reasons that the Good Friday Agreement that John mentioned was so successful was precisely because of the single group work that had been done in preparation. I've also been trying to connect dots and explore partnerships among my grantees, for example, between ZMOM and Accord and the Center for Peace Communication. Um, the Tannenbaum Center and the Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees have both done capacity building plans and those are in place. But what I'd like to do is mention what One Voice is doing to prepare. Um, since One Voice is indirectly one of our grantees because Zimam is a spinoff of One Voice. So they've been dealing directly with USAID and asking technical questions. They um, have been helping Zimam prepare for USAID funding by investing in an in external consultancy uh, to helping them learn about organizational financial management and the complexities of USAID applications because you know you need it's very labor intensive you need a specialist just to deal with with USAID and ensuring that Palestinian partners have the internal capacity to be as competitive as possible for the grant itself and focusing on the Palestinian dilemma, which is that there were fewer Palestinians and Palestinian-led organization than Israelis and Israeli organizations currently engaged in this work. So there's an imbalance there that, that needs to be corrected. 
Thank you, Georgia. That was fascinating. And um, I'm now going to move on to uh, Danny. Um, Danny is representing the shared society part of this field. And uh, Danny, tell me a little bit about the work that you are involved in in this field. Okay, thank uh, you very much, Georgette. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Georgette, and thank you, Maya. And John, um, well, I got involved in this field in 2004 when I established this organization called Budo for Peace. Budo is martial arts. So the idea was to bring Jewish and Arab and ultra-Orthodox kids together on the platform of a sport, which was martial arts and the values, like a respect and um, tolerance and, uh, and harmony within yourself and with others. And so from 2004 until now, that's what I've been doing. But 10 years later, I became also interested in running and mountain biking. And that started a transition in, uh, in other sports and understanding that I was part of a wide and active sport for peace community. In uh, 2014, I co-organized an event called the Middle East Peace Run, where I brought an ultra marathon runner who ran two marathons a day for 20 days from the north of Lebanon, through Jordan, through Israel, through the West Bank. And uh, it was like a um, Forrest Gump where people were running with him and it created an awareness through sport that uh, there's possibilities of, of peace. Then in, after that, 2015, I was invited to speak at APAC. It was the first time ever that they, APAC had a panel discussion for coexistence. I spoke about the field of sport and peace, and that's where I met Ormet uh, for the first time. And after that, two years later, I organized a, an event called Ride for Peace, which was with the Gaza Youth Committee. It was a group of Gazans that rode their bikes on one side of the border and Israelis on the other, and about 100 of us. And at the end of the ride, we Skyped each other, and it was very inspiring and, and powerful. Uh, so, after that, uh, we won the regional NGO of the year by Peace and Sport, which is run by the Prince of Monaco. I'm saying that only because I realized there that we are part of a global community of sports for peace, where there was a lot of co collaboration and sharing of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So from the field in Israel, I knew of many sports for peace organizations that were doing great work, but were working in isolation. And that is, there's so much experience and uh, shared knowledge to create a greater impact for the individual organizations, for the field as a whole. Uh -huh. So in 2019, we trialed the idea of creating a coalition of sports for peace stakeholders, working with uh, three sets of stakeholders, the organizations uh, in the field, academia and funders. And we initiated the International Day of Peace and Sport I was in Ramla, and uh, Ormet was a, a, a partner in this. And it was a collaboration of 13 sports for peace organizations and 10 sports with 400 kids. And as you see here in the picture, um, they were holding up a white card. And, uh, and we actually had a Haredi guy do a hip hop session where everybody danced. Uh, yeah. It was really wonderful. Um, so from there, uh, we issued a, a basic survey to map out the concerns, the shared interests, and the challenges uh, in the field. And that was conducted by fellow JFN member, Dr. Nancy Strickland. Uh, and using that survey, we created a JFN funders cohort meeting for funders interested in the nexus between sports and social change. So the data, the positive experience of the collaboration and the interest of funders in the field led to the understanding that we had to create a space for all stakeholders. That's the organization, the funders, the academics, the government and corporate sector. And in, in this particular ecosystem would lead to much greater impact. After researching about collective impact models, which some of you are familiar with, I realized that it was necessary to invest 
as a backbone organization to develop a sports and social change coalition. And the backbone is dedicated to facilitating and driving the coalition process forward. And we initiated this with uh, 11 different organizations as a steering committee. And you see here the different organizations, some small, some large, some have uh, the mandate of peace, some not, some just do uh, sports for kids at risk, but then 50% uh, of their members are Arabs. So that by default, they are doing uh, peace work. So look here, 32,000 participants just within the 11 organizations. Wow. Yeah. Danny, that's, uh, that's quite a journey that you uh, went through. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, I wanted to ask you, what is the opportunity that you see here as a funder with MEPA? What's the opportunity? Well, the, the opportunity is now. You now in sport, it's all about timing and recovery. Uh, but the circumstances now has created a pull and push situation. The pull was the MEPA fund, an amazing opportunity for those battling grassroots organizations to get significant funding for the programs. But at the same time, there was a push this year by the drastic effects of the coronavirus to do something different. Because all the contact sports were severely affected, the organizations were now more vulnerable and therefore more open for collaboration. Then came the unrest of May this year. That was a real dong on the head. As a martial artist, I've had my share of dong on the heads. And I understood we needed to do things drastically different. And together as a dedicated community in order to make a real change. So initially for the members uh, of the coalition, MEPA served as a buy-in to join in the coalition. But I do see the coalition also as an opportunity for other funders to leverage their investment, like I'm doing in the field. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm jumping to the last question because we have uh, three minutes left for this part. So maybe you could expand on what you've been doing to prepare your grantees to, uh, to prepare future resilience and what capacity building measures have you taken okay. with them. I'm gonna show this map, uh, you see this map, this is just to show you these 10 organizations are active in 321 locations. What a wonderful thing, the wonderful thing about sport is the massive scalability. When we initiated the coalition, we had 30 organizations and that's not including community centers or sports federations. So imagine the impact we can do in the field. So for, as, as a funder, um, we are uh, investing in a dedicated team and partners to drive the process forward. Professional mapping for database decision-making for everyone. We're using the NAS research and consulting headed by Abhibit Hai, who most of you know. We have a dedicated management team to drive the process forward. And we have professional partners to create the mechanism for the collaboration, including Shutafim, where the leaders in collective impact. So that's workshops, conferences, training, uh, joint activities, learning better uh, best practice. In progress. So before helping the individual members we also, to build capacity, we also um, are sharing, uh, we also um, first mapping the needs of the field, the assets and the gaps for database decision-making. From that, we understand that what is already being done uh, in the sports for social change area, we identify where are the gaps. And while we've ex we're exploring how the coalition can fill those gaps, examples of the gaps are you see on that map, you know, 321 locations, we could be in many more locations and the age and gender groups that aren't targeted, uh, whether there's an international dialogue in programs with trained facilitators or not, uh, the differences and lack of evaluation and monitoring, and many others. So from these findings, we will be having discussions to develop common agenda and new programs and solutions that we didn't even think of, you know, that fill in the gaps, such as alumni programs, youth leadership, summer camps, you know, Shirut Lumi is service, civil service programs for the Arab sector, volunteering programs, equal representation of the sectors in management. 
So there are many things that we can do as a coalition. And I think the takeaway um, from my experience is that by creating a space to encourage this collaboration between all stakeholders will allow us to identify what is needed and to find new solutions to move that needle towards greater collective impact. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Georgette, and thank you, Danny, for sharing with us and giving us the insights from your uh, work in the field. Um, I'd like to open it up now for the questions, and um, we'll take some questions from the chat as well. But if you want to ask a question, you can also raise your hand with the reactions that you have on the Zoom. Um, sorry. That was the timer. And um, or you can ask the question uh, directly if you'd like, or you can drop it in the chat. Um, John, and also if you could say who the question is for, because you can ask questions uh, of all three of our speakers. Um, John, are you, are you there? Are you with me? I am, I am. OK, did you have a chance uh, to look at the chat and to see you can maybe start with the first question? Yes, yeah, so I, I've answered some of them in the chat, oh. uh, just to try, because I know that we're, we're a little bit short on time. Yeah. Um, some ones that I haven't gotten to yet, which I can answer um, now. One was around uh, from Marla around uh, environmental work, and this is actually something I should have mentioned in the, in the initial comments. So environmental um, programming, sustainability, combating climate change are explicitly referred to in the call for proposals which has been published. And one thing I should have also mentioned is the format for submissions. There's a seven page concept note, which is the first stage of applications. And there needs to be reference for policy or um, approach to climate change or sustainability in your concept note. And that indicates a very much elevated uh, um, sort of focus on the issue compared to CMM, which is our comparison in previous rounds. And maybe just to dwell on that proposal framework as well, the stages are a seven page concept note, no budget required, um, no SAMS registration needing to be done first off. Then a second round is called the co-creation phase where USAID will, will say that you've gotten through to that second round and then work with you to develop and flesh out the, the proposal with budgets and, and monitoring and evaluation approaches. And then there's a signature, the final stage where the grant is um, is confirmed. So it's it's not that arduous a first stage. Concept note needs to be strong, but it's not a, a huge 40 page uh, application, which I should have mentioned at the outset. Um, I think another question that came up in that time that I didn't get to, first of all, on shared society, because it's a very important point from Sarah, and I don't want to be reductive about this. We are not uh, in any way saying that organizations for whom it's not a good fit, who are working in the shared society space inside Israel, should be moving into cross-border at all. Uh, and that the, the money should be seen as some sort of incentive for mission creep or a sort of um, a lack of focus. One thing we do observe, because all MEPS membership includes both shared society and cross-border, is there is some very very good programming taking place in shared, in shared society, some excellent emerged leaders, both Arab and Jewish, and the opportunity maybe, if it's a good fit, for some mentorship, sort of project cooperation, but again, only if it is a good fit. The last thing I would want to try and, and, and convey, and I was being quite brief earlier, is that we think everybody should so, suddenly start doing cross-border, and that's absolutely not what we're trying to convey. And, and then the final question that I saw come up in the interim was around Jerusalem, which is a difficult one. Um, so I'll be very careful what I say here. There is not a clear policy around which bucket Jerusalem falls into with regards to shared society versus cross-border. However, from some consultations that we've had, the rule seems to be that if the stakeholder themselves, the Palestinian or Arab stakeholder, is not a citizen of the state of Israel, which is the situation for most East Jerusalemites, then it will be counted as cross-border. But there is an implication that you could potentially tick both boxes with some Jerusalem programming. So that sort of blend between cross-border and shared society. So I think it's something that could be referred to in a concept note in a, in both senses, essentially. I think that's most of the questions, if not there all. There was a question in the beginning, is there an agreed upon, e upon end goal, e.g. two state, one state, restart of peace talks? Yes, so the, um, the Lowy Fund is really unusual in that it's a bipartisan law that was enacted that says two state solution in it, that has Republican and Democrat votes and has dollars behind it. 
very, very unusual. Um, so it is explicitly designed to try and strengthen the chances for a two-state solution and to create capacity toward it. Um, it's important to say that whilst that is the policy goal within it, from conversations we've had with technical staff at USAID, they will not be dismissing or neglecting or refusing to work with organizations for whom a two-state solution is not an explicit policy goal. So it, it's, I want to be clear about that. It's not simply for two-state solution explicit organizations, um, but the policy goal it's trying to achieve is two states. And there is language in the most in the, the uh, call for proposals that talks about, as I said earlier, this needing to scale up to policy change. So we think that's a, it's a great declaration of intent for, for, for those of us that support a two-state solution, um, but it's not only speaking to the converted. It's also for people who may not be um, proponents of a two-state solution who can be stakeholders in programming. Thank you. There's another question here in the chat. Why is, why is the first year allocation only $46 million and not $50 million? Yes, yeah, so, so what that is, is that the USAID component of the first year's appropriation is $46 million. The remainder, it's three and a half million to four, is gone to the DFC, which is the economic development uh, aspect of it. So the full $50 million will be drawn down. But in the first year, the lion's share of it has gone to USAID. And we expect that to be rebalanced in later years. But it's important to note that if the full appropriation isn't spent within the fiscal year, it can be carried forward into the subsequent year. Um, which we expect may be the case in the first year as the, the pump is being primed. Um, Thank you. John, I actually had a, a question in the chat that I sent you a minute ago. Um, and yes. the question has to do with, with single group work in preparation for cross-border work. Do you think that those kinds of proposals will be um, looked on favorably? Um, so yes, and I, I agree, George, Ed, entirely with your analysis as well about the importance of this work, particularly as like a first stage towards ripeness for cross-border. And it's too often neglected by uh, donor, donor states who want to kind of fast track to the, the last stage. Um, so there is new language in the call for proposals that was published in September, which indicates that that funding will be admissible for funding. Um, that work will be admissible for funding rather. Now, I, I suspect it may be disadvantaged to cross-border. So if you imagine the hierarchy, I think cross-border work will probably be the highest priority, followed then by shared society work inside Israel and uninational work in, uh, in the West Bank or Gaza. Um, but it's a lot of money. So we still expect that some of it will be funded, particularly if the rest of the work being proposed is very consistent with what the Lowy Fund is trying to achieve. So I think if the terminology used in the application is very clearly chiming with what the legislation is looking for, but the stakeholders, at least at the first stage, are only Palestinians, that will put it in a, a sort of a better chance of receiving that funding. If I could just piggyback on that, is what's being done to outreach to organizations so that they're fully aware of it. Okay, and you, Valion, I see you. I'll, I'll get to you. Um, so, so the start with the timer. Timeline question is that the, the timeline is starting. Now, I want to be really clear. Funding applications will be accepted from, or will be sort of eligible for, for review from the end of October, but that does not mean that they're going to be reviewed immediately. What we found with the last round of conflict management and mitigation in April was there was an unprecedented number of applications, which is great news. And maybe some issues around capacity for them all to be reviewed within a very small funding window. So USAID have decided to have a rolling application process over the coming 12 months for this first call. And I want to be really clear, I would not race towards getting an application submitted by the 20th of October, because it may just sit on a hard drive for three or four months before anybody looks at it. I would take the time to get the best possible proposal ready and submitted. And the other point around timeline is please look at this as a minimum five year process rather than a single year and try and submit an application. You probably won't get funding Right, that's just the, the, the law of supply and demand, but you'll get feedback from USAID, which will strengthen your hand for the next application. And then hopefully at some point over those five years, you will receive a game changing amount of funding for an organization. So as I said, it's a marathon rather than a sprint. And we expect, although it's not definite, that there will be more money being added to that call for proposals, which is at $15 million minimum. So don't be afraid the money is going to run out very quickly in your application won't be, won't be uh, reviewed. Um, That's good news. And I'd like to let you, Val, uh, 
you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure, yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so I was wondering, you know, so we talked about all this money that's gonna be made available through MEPA. Um, it, it, does all MEP itself get funded through MEPA as well, or, or how, how is all MEP funded? No, so our, thank you, Yuval. Our, our model is that we depend on private philanthropy and we go off and talk to governments and try and turn $1 into thousands of dollars, essentially. Um, uh, but we're, we're dependent upon private philanthropy and we don't want to compete with our members for these grants. We work to try and unlock funding for them. It's not impossible at some point we may apply for funding for capacity building to strengthen the field if we can't find private philanthropy that can support us at that level. Uh, but we are historically, uh, exclusively historically, funded by private philanthropy. Um, and there was a question, I, I think, also that came around how we're communicating this to the field. So all of our members know we have 156 members at the moment. So they are probably sick of getting emails from us explaining everything. But we would also love your help to get it out to the much wider peace building field and, and its partners beyond uh, just all MEP members. So whilst our membership is big, it's not everybody. So please, if you're speaking to grantees and if you need resources, I'll put my email again into the chat. I'd be happy to, so to um, send along documents that you can simply forward to grantees. And the last point as well is, if we see peace building and people to people work more narrowly, getting a lot of government funding, I think one of the roles for private philanthropy, as I mentioned, is to try and grow their capacity so they can overachieve with that funding so that every dollar we've unlocked with this advocacy actually does two dollars work, right? Because the organizations are efficient and scaled and ready to go. But then the other part a little bit later in this process is figuring out what can't be funded by MEPA, right? Because maybe it's too much direct advocacy against governments or for government and it would be, wouldn't be permissible for government funding. Or maybe it's connective tissue between organizations to make things more efficient. I think there's a role because private philanthropy can move much more quickly and be much more sort of entrepreneurial in what it does. It's taken us 15 years to see MEPA enacted. So that shows you the speed with which government can move sometimes by comparison. So the role that private philanthropy can play here is really, really important at both ends of that funding paradigm, helping to grow capacity. And then when the capacity is generated and we see 10, 20 times as many alumni from these programs, what are they doing? What organizations are ready to scoop up those young people and begin to, to build out the sort of pro-peace movement on both sides of the green line? And that's likely going to be private philanthropy's role rather than government. Thank you. We're going a tiny bit over time, but um, I think this is a really good question. Climate change will severely affect the entire region and holds potential for regional collaboration and for strengthening shared society. Are initiatives in this field eligible? Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned, but yes, absolutely. Not just eligible, called out and prioritized very, yeah. very clearly as a top priority within the, the, the NOFO. So I would encourage anybody in that space to really get an application together. And it's also, just as an aside, environmental work tends to be more expensive than many other kinds with a lot of capital costs associated with it. And we're quite excited about the way in which the economic development part of MEPA and the civic part can potentially be revenue sources for environmental work. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, we uh, have to end here. It was engaging and fascinating and full of information and inspiring as well to hear all the work that's being done in the field. Um, thank you for joining us. We have, uh, we'll, we'll have more uh, learning opportunities, I'm sure in the future about this. If you have any questions or if you need more information, you're always welcome to, uh, to contact me or anyone else from the JFN staff and we can pass on the information. This session will be posted on the JFN YouTube channel in probably a few days. But if there's anything else that you want um, me to send, you you can always contact me. Um, and um, we have the Israel Idea Festival coming up uh, at the end of October, towards the end of October. And Reut is going to put in the chat, she did just put in the chat uh, a link for registration. Um, thank you, Georgette. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure. Thank and you, Maya. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Keep thank well. Danny. Bye bye. Bye bye.